Uh, good evening. I'd like to call to order the regular meeting of the Boulder Valley School District Board of Education for January 13th. Uh, Sandy, will you please call the roll? Albright? Here. Belleville? Here. Benford? Here. Fuqua? Here. Marquis? Here. Myers? Here. Reed? Here. Uh, please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. It's that justice part. Um, I would like to remind everyone who's here tonight in the audience and who is, might be listening um, on television about the vision of the Boulder Valley School District. And it reminds me, us of why we are here and why we are doing this work. Um, the vision, which was developed a year and a half ago, we develop our children's greatest abilities and make possible the discovery and pursuit of their dreams, which when fulfilled will benefit us all. We provide a comprehensive and innovative approach to education and graduate successful, curious, lifelong learners who confidently confront the great challenges of their time. So we have a great vision and a lot of work to do to reach that vision. So um, the first item on our agenda today is the... I have to look. It's the superintendent's report. So, Dr. Messenger. I'm ready. Thank, Thank you. you. President Albright, members of the board, uh, good evening and welcome. Um, so, uh, I appreciate having a chance to visit with you. My first uh, item of um, business this evening is to say thank you to you. This is January, is the National School Board's Recognition Month, and uh, I posted a blog on that yesterday and encourage folks to both be aware of that and also to communicate with you. They have time to do that. I just, on behalf of my cabinet, our staff here and throughout the district and our community, we appreciate your volunteer effort, uh, the many hours you commit. But it, for us, it's not just the time and talent you add, but it's your commitment to public education, which is uh, evidenced by your service, but also your advocacy, both in our community and the capital and beyond. Uh, making sure we maintain high quality schools for our children and our district is a place where children and students excel and that is the result of our extreme supportive community and also your fine governance and leadership so we're honored to serve uh, with you uh, i am as your superintendent and our cabinet and member of our faculty so thank you thank you for your service and your willingness to stand up and give your time and model for our community on what public service is this is this is public service at its best and those of us that work closest with you know that it's a big commitment, so thank you for doing that. Um, so on le a little less positive, maybe, uh, I want to talk to you a little bit about student assessment. So thank you for your service, and now we'll talk about student assessment. So I wanted to give you an update. As you know, if you had a chance to read the media today, there was a, a, a media report of the final work of the House Bill 1202 Task Force, and so they're finalizing their formal report to give to the legislature no later than the end of this month. And uh, my understanding is tomorrow, Wednesday, they will be having some conversation with the uh, legislative leadership. So they've made some uh, recommendations for consideration by the legislature and our state, and there were some areas they couldn't reach agreement on. So there was some division within the committee on a few of the topics, but. Um, one of the things, at least I read in the media this morning, was that uh, they would eliminate this uh, test for our senior age students, which is one of the areas we had advocated for. So I did an interview this afternoon uh, for the camera, and I think our position has been pretty consistently, and we've tried to communicate that to the committee, and probably will with legislators, is that we really would like to see the state uh, embrace the required uh, assessment standards that come from the federal government for now. Uh, that's where we were under TCAP as far as not the same test but the same levels that would reduce the level of testing uh, notably. And uh, as the uh, Congress works on reauthorization of the Elementary and Secondary Education Act or No Child Left Behind, uh, we might lobby that to do something different with assessment, but presently we know that we are required to at least do that. And that's where we were prior to this most recent legislation around student assessment. And it's pretty close to where the state board was in their last resolution. They had a couple differences, but that federal required level is where we had hoped this committee would get, but they didn't quite get there. So we'll keep you informed on that. As we gain information, there will be a number of bills introduced is our understanding. Uh, so stay tuned and uh, we'll figure out which of those we think might be the best and the ones to support. With that, we will be meeting with our district leadership next week and working with them on the plan for the spring. I mean, we are under pres uh, present legislation, so uh, we will be doing formal communication with our faculty and our parents, um, one this month and another next month in February, walking towards March when the assessments will begin. 
We're building schedules. We're anticipating uh, what resources we need to do that. We'll give you an update in the spring after we get through the spring assessment that we'll build on the report we gave you back in November. Uh, so that's work that we're doing. One of the issues that we will communicate with parents and staff about is if students or families decide they don't want their students to take the test, there is no opt-out option in the state assessment. That's been made very clear to us. Um, but um, certainly parents can refuse if they choose to to have their children participate in the test. If they do so, we're going to help them understand what that involves and what they need to do. So that'll be some of what we communicate because that question comes up as many as any questions we get is what if we don't want our children to participate, what, what are the implications of that? So we'll do our best based on what we know, uh, how um, that will look for the spring. And so those are some of the big areas we'll be communicating on. Again, the window starts in March and kind of runs through the end of the school year over the course of the, all the different assessments. So student assessment, that's the big work we're getting ready for right now. Uh, the other is that uh, we had a good session with you on strategic planning in December, so thank you. We appreciated the questions and an opportunity to respond. Some of those we have continued to follow up on. And then as a part of your planning retreat on January 5th, we wound up talking a fair amount that day about uh, strategic planning. And so uh, we've tentatively scheduled for uh, Tuesday, January 27th, which would be two weeks from tonight, that our kind of pre-formal meeting, that five to six time, over a light meal uh, that's right now that's a topic we'd like to return to and we don't want too much time to pass we want to continue the conversation we have some new information we'd like to share with you and, and visit with you about and we anticipate this probably will be an ongoing conversation but um, anyway um, I just want to kind of give you a heads up that unless something bumps into that five o'clock time that's what we're gonna uh, that's the time we'd like to return to it so uh, bond planning, uh, I just want to, uh, we'll talk more about this in two weeks again on the 27th of January, but uh, we're getting ready to do a request for proposal for an innovation consultant. This will be a firm that comes in and works with our district to help design what we'll call guidelines around innovative practices and 21st century learning standards. There's a lot written out there on that, and uh, we want it to be what's right for BBSD, so this consultant or firm would uh, work with us on that and then we will have a district level staff that will involve faculty and parents and others that will work through the winter and spring um, establishing what those standards will be going forward and then our plan would be those will help influence the design um, going forward in each of the buildings as they create their school-based design team so uh, we'll keep you informed on that uh, we're also now beginning to staff up with project managers and folks that we employ to, to begin this work. And so um, not unlike our last bond, that's work that's going on right now. Then on the 27th, we'll bring to you uh, the bond oversight committee charge and have you review that and make sure you're comfortable with that. And then that starts the process where folks can make application, you can make recommendations. And then a month or so later, we bring back a recommended um, membership for that bond oversight committee. So stay tuned to that. Those are some of the things we're doing right now. Some great conversation going on in the district and uh, still a lot of excitement about opportunity that's coming at us through the, the bond build out. Um, school calendar, um, on your consent agenda tonight, there was an article in the camera this morning about uh, we really have worked internally and gone through our process. This, the next two calendar, two years of calendar that you have in your packet this evening is um, we can talk more about it if you want, but it is on consent, so I just wanted to give you a heads up, is really rolling our present calendar forward for two more years. We went through extensive public dialogue and got to the calendar we have. It's, you know, no calendar is perfect, but we think we found uh, a pretty good spot for where we are right now. Um, one of the good news is, is that over time, these hot days in August or the spring, is not only will some of our buildings be air conditioned as a result of this bond, but every building will have a review, a recommissioning of their ventilation system. So we're confident that um, now, that isn't going to happen overnight because it'll take us years to get through all the buildings, but um, this calendar we're bringing forward is one that we um, is very much like the present calendar. The one change is that we was noted in the article in the paper, I'd mentioned if you didn't catch it when you looked at the packet, is that we're building a flex day and there's multiple days up front, like five, for professional development and work in the, for their staff, that if a staff chooses to move a day to sometime earlier than that week, because that works for them for training or work they need to do, They'll go through their shared decision-making process, and then they'll be able to move that day. So that's some, some flexibility they've asked for. So we're ready to manage that, and we think we're ready to do it with the amount of uh, shared decision-making training we've done across the district. So uh, we'll evaluate that over time. 
And the last thing I would mention uh, real quickly is that we have a number of administrative openings, both principal at the elementary, middle, and high, and so uh, and also some administrative openings in this office. And so we are uh, just getting that work started right now. We've been preparing for it for the last several months and doing advertising and recruiting, and now we're uh, at it. So we're meeting it with schools and meeting with parents and getting input from faculty and uh, parents. And then uh, we are scheduled to do interviews late February through March. And our goal is, at least for our present vacancies, that we'll have recommendations to you in early April for appointments. So that's if we can stay on schedule. So I just wanted to remind you and the community that's the timeline we're on. And uh, we're looking forward to high quality candidates making an application to our district and serving as well. So with that, I will end my comments. President Albright, I'll be glad to answer any questions that the board might have. Okay, thank you very much. Board members, any questions or comments to Dr. Messenger's report? Tina. Um, just you brought up ventilation. Could you give us an update on how the um, the consultants did at Casey and yes. how what your feelings are and how that's moving forward? Yeah, so we Thanks. had uh, representatives from the University of Tulsa um, um, uh, indoor air quality diagnostics, I think, is the name of their company. Uh, but um, uh, Dr. Shaughnessy is on faculty, lead faculty at the University of Tulsa. That's how we know his work <coughs> on indoor air quality. They did a walkthrough and met with um, technicians and folks that have been working on this and our own employees um, in early January, I believe. So they have prepared a preliminary report of their findings and observations and recommendations. And so we are right now, I think, preparing a communication back to the community based on what they found and what their recommendations are. Um, and then uh, our plan is to schedule a community forum uh, with the Casey community of the public forum for faculty and parents uh, at a time that Dr. Shaughnessy and Mr. Smith can be there. And um, so they might do some presentation of sharing of what they're thinking uh, and then also open it up for some questions. And so that's. Um, I don't, I don't know that data, I don't know if it's been set yet, but in the near term we'll be doing that. You know, I think um, some of what was reported in the paper is this has been a journey for us at Casey. Uh, you know, what we've discovered is it wasn't any one thing, it was a combination of things, and so maybe we got the big low-hanging fruit taken care of first, but we continue to find refinements that uh, will help us get this down to a, a natural level of, um, you know, what's in the air naturally. That's the work that we're uh, going towards and trying to determine when and why there might be fluctuations in that and what we can do or what is contributing to that. So, I mean, I really do feel like we're at the fine-tuned place now, but we're not there yet. And, um, you know, it was great having them there. We'd sent them a lot of data over the fall, uh, Don and his team, Don Orr, and I was involved in a couple of conference calls with them and listened into their expertise. This is what they do all the time. And then at the end of the conference, one of the last conference calls, they said, all right, now we've got to come. We've got to actually be there. We've got to look at the topography. We've got to, there are other things that we can't do over the phone. We need to come. So that was great having them here. And I think they observed some things that will be helpful to us in the long run. And they affirmed a lot of what we've done is absolutely the right thing to do. But it's good to get a fresh set of eyes on it. And so we're looking for a report in the near term, Katina. And we'll, obviously, we've copied you on those that are all posted <clears throat> on the KC website. And, you know, our goal is to, you know, get there this spring. So thanks for asking. Great. Thanks. Okay. John? You mentioned the retreat, Bruce. I'm just wondering, are we're supposed to get some sort of written report? Back we are to get, I was actually thinking of that this morning. Uh, I'll drop Tim a note. Yes, uh, I anticipate we'll get a write-up from that, and then uh, I will share that back with the full board and uh, see what homework we have as a result of that. I can remember some things we said we would do, uh, but I've not received that yet, but I'll touch base with Tim and see if it's going to be coming to us soon. And then you also mentioned um, more work on the strategic plan on the yeah. 27th, and yes. you know, I couldn't make agenda setting, so I'm, I'm not clear what we're going to be doing on the 27th. Like. What, what is that? Well, we we want to. Um, we've had some. We just today were on a conference call. Deirdre and I were. Uh, Dr. Pilch and I were with Education Northwest. We've talked to you about that. We we worked back with them again on what the deliverables are. They won't be here by the 27th, but we want to give you an update on that work. And then some of the conversation we ended at the, after a long day in the retreat were some of these intermediate uh, measure pieces. And um, and you commented on that. We want to come back to your comments and the questions you had about that. So really just a more informal dialogue. We just didn't want too much uh, time to pass. And then, and then I think we'll be able to more confidently lay out these next steps in the timeline based on the conference call we had today. Uh, again, we won't have that work by the 27th, but we'll want to walk through that timeline with you as well. 
Thank you. Anyone else? Jo uh, Jenny, sorry. Jenny. So I'm going to follow up on um, Shelly's question about the strategic plan okay. and say, as, as I recall, I mean, so I, I'm just going to ask if this is appropriate. As I recall, one of the things we did at our work session in December was to sort of shoot you and Beard for questions. Mm -hmm. So if we have more questions, hey, as absolutely. We, that the, and maybe we can send them ahead of time as well. That would yeah. be great. Yeah. Maybe I should do a call yeah. for that. Because, be because as we become more, you know, have an opportunity to relook at the parts of the plan. <coughs> absolutely. We'd that. welcome that. <coughs> I thought of some. Um, and then I'm just wondering, so how, I, I know that last year when we were giving still the old TCAP, um, mm -hmm. our curriculum didn't necessarily align very well with the assessments. Mm -hmm. Is that still a problem this year? I, I think we're more confident on what, from what we know now that the new assessments will be a better alignment. You know, I don't want to go too, say too much, because truly until we know more about the assessment itself and administer it a time or two and then see the results. You might recall we gave the CMAS, uh, Science and Social Studies, uh, Colorado Measurement of Academic Success, Science and Social Studies for summer students last spring, and we got that data back this fall. And my comments at the time were, so how helpful is it? We say, well, we don't know. <laughs> we need to look at the results and look at our own curriculum to see how informative it is. But yes, I think overall, we this was intended to align with the Colorado State content standards. And uh, our curriculum, for the most part, aligns with that and some more. So there'll be some things that we do that are unique to Boulder Valley that probably won't be measured there. But yes, overall, we feel that the alignment should be much better and hopefully the results will be more meaningful. Okay, and so, and, and now this is my fault. I somehow, even though we've talked about how many how how the, the assessment burden has become too heavy, I hadn't quite realized how heavy it had become. So it would be interesting to me when we have one to see what the schedules okay. look like. I can give you some samples at each level. Maybe would be. I mean, yeah. they'll be different between buildings at levels, but probably if you look at one high school schedule. It would be, especially a comprehensive high school, to be reflective and then a middle school. And they're working within their own schedules to, I mean, they're still working on it To One of the things we're keeping track of is the amount of time that our staff's investing in getting ready for the test, building the schedules, all the things you've asked for. So Jonathan Dings, um, our director of assessment, we're, we prepared a survey and are going to put it out just so they can kind of keep a running record. I mean, we just think we should look at the whole picture. It isn't just the time the students and staff spend on the taking the test. There's a lot of time preparing. Well, well and I know about that, but I, I actually I have to thank Shelley because when you sent out, sent out that question about the six days at the high school level, I went, I thought to myself, I had, I mean, even though we've talked about it, I really had no we'll, idea. We'll get so, you some sample schedules. So, so that would be great. And then let's see. Oh, and, and I'd like to say that um, we did pre you did talk about the new process for hiring non administrators at, at our work session yeah. just now and, and and I am for one I'm I'm, I'm glad I, I was glad to hear a couple of things but I'm really glad to hear that we that we're adopting a process that won't actually drive qualified candidates away from our district I mean, so, process um, I look forward to um, some good results from this and some your follow up <coughs> on that. We we look forward to that as well so thanks for your support with that Tom Sam Okay, so um, Tina. Sorry, I'm um, just another follow up on testing. I think at the beginning of the year, you spoke about whether we'd be able to um, give our results from the REDAC, from the I Station, I Ready to the state. That there is, I think there's some um, request that we do that. And could you just um, give an update on whether we are doing that? And then will there be transparency around that date, that data to the public? Um, either within our district or from the states, from okay. the CDE website. Yeah, I'll need to follow up on that team and see where we are, so thanks. Anyone else? So um, I have a question, uh, or maybe it's a comment. So um, I am really glad that we're preparing a report about how much time um, staff, members are, staff members are spending on preparing for the testing and how much it costs and just exactly how much work it involves. Um, it would be great if we could give that report, and I, I mean, we can't do it in advance, but do we have projections that we could give to the, our legislators as they're, before they make their decisions about what testing is? I mean, I just think it's really important to think about the timing and that um, our information be put out there at, with the hope that we're persuading them to um, understand the unintended consequences of their planning and how they're suggesting that we do a better job here. 
Well, the report under um, Leslie Stafford's leadership this fall, with the help of many, you've received and we've shared right. that, as you know, with our legislators. Right. So we'll certainly have and we've distributed that document fairly widely to other school districts that have requested it. I right. think what we can do and would plan to do is <coughs> use that. I mean, once we know what bill we're supporting or lobbying for, uh, I think then at that time, Lori, we could at least do some examples or estimated. So it, it might not be a summative quantitative document, which we'll be able to do after the spring assessment, but I think we could certainly frame the kinds of things that are involved and, and give some reference to the amount of time of teacher time and technical staff and um, the proctor's time and those kinds of things. So yeah, I think that we can enrich that without having it be final. Yeah. Great. Yeah, I think the, the more we talk about what the consequences are, both to our legislators and to our public, I just think it's important that we know what, yeah. what we're getting into. I had one more question about the testing, uh -huh. and that was, I, I may have misunderstood you, but I think what you said was that um, it's been clear, made clear to us that from the state that we don't, that parents don't have an opt-out option. Correct. So does that conflict with any of our policies? We have opt-out options for our parents who choose not to participate in an activity or a curriculum. Curricular events, right. So are we in conflict? Um, at, does, does their state opinion override our policies? That's a good question. We actually had not looked at that. We can follow up with that. Um, Lori, where, where we're going to land with this is that uh, we're not going to, so we're going to inform parents that if they choose to opt out or request their children or refuse to have their children participate, then we're going to ask them to communicate that to the school. And then we'll follow our policy and regulation around attendance and that will be considered an excused absence. And so um, there will be no punishment uh, if they are in attendance at the school and they don't leave, but they choose not to participate and are not disruptive, then there will be no consequence. Um, and if they're, if they're disruptive, you know, then we'll deal with that just like we would any other day of the week. But um, so that's the guidance we'll give the parents. So I don't think it closes the door. It certainly doesn't close it and lock it. I think what we'll do is help parents understand our biggest challenge truly on this will be these tests are embedded throughout the school day. So whereas in the fall where students um, chose not to take their test and the parents supported that, they simply didn't come to school for that portion of the day and they came right. to school for the rest of the day. This will be more difficult to manage both for our school staff as well as parents and students because of the nature of how they're going to be administered. So that's we just know there's some logistics around that that we're going to need to manage if we have a high participation and refusal rate so but we'll you know that's all the information we'll be sharing with parents when they request it. okay good well I it's, it's just kind of an interesting idea to think that a school board or a superintendent or a legislator could say to a kid you got to take this test yeah. you know put your fingers on the keyboard and start typing right. um, you know I don't have a lot of control over that so it's um, we're, we're being asked to do things that are they're, they're pretty tough to to have consequences to so good I'm glad we're um, thinking about that for our parents. I think it's important for them to know. Thank you. Are there other comments or questions to the superintendent's report or in general? Okay, Jenny. Um, so, so it seems to me like at some point within the last year or two, I've heard conversations from high schools about withholding recommendation letters to students who don't participate in the tests because um, they lower the schools. By doing that, they lower the school's overall score. So we're not going to be... Um, High schools are not going to be withholding recommendation letters. No, we uh, we had good conversation around that, and we'll meet with the Deirdre and I will meet and Mark and Sandy with each of the levels next week. And as we did in the fall, there you know we're going to manage this just as I described, and um, so um, it'll be a, a student's decision and their parents to whether they participate in and how they choose not to if they don't. But uh, there will be no punishment unless their actions are disruptive in another way. Uh, but there will not be any of those actions taken. Thank you. Thank you very you much. My got, pleasure. Got a lot going on. We're got busy. A lot going on. But, I mean, we didn't even comment on the whole thing, but good. Thank you. Um, the next item on our agenda is public participation, and we have one speaker who has signed up to come speak this evening. The board recognizes the value of public comment on issues related to the operation of the schools. To ensure that our meeting is conducted in an orderly manner, we ask the persons who address the board, combine your comments to matters that are germane to the business of the school district. Speakers on agenda items will be heard first, followed by non-agenda items. Limit your presentation to two minutes. If we go over the first hour, which we won't, we have one speaker. Uh, recognize that students often attend or view our meetings. Speakers' remarks, therefore, should be suitable for an audience. That includes kindergarten through 12th grade students. 
Um, I may interrupt, warn, or terminate a participant's statement that is unrelated to the business of the district and appropriate for K-12 students. There's a lighting system on the podium. Starts at green when your two minutes are up, turns yellow when you have 30 seconds remaining, and it turns red at the end. When the light turns red, please wrap up your comments so that the board can hear from, can proceed with our agenda, hear from the maximum number of students. So, um, tonight we have one speaker who signed up, that would be Helen Petak. Um, so, Helen, welcome. We're glad to have you come and speak and address the board. Thank you for being here this evening. Thank you, and thank you for allowing me this opportunity to speak with you. So, my name is Helen Petak. I am the parent of three children who have previously graduated from Boulder Valley School District, and I've been a teacher at Fairview High School in the Science and Computer Science departments for about the last 10 years. The last two years I was on leave in Washington doing some work with the federal government and I've had a chance now to reflect on my return on some of the changes and just progressions that have happened over the past couple of years. And I just wanted to share some of those observations with you. Perhaps the most notable from my microcosm is that slowly class size has edged up. And if I were to think about this from a fourth grade perspective, that means that a teacher now instead of teaching 26 students might teach 27. And you might say, well, does that really change the day? So I don't really want to comment on that. But at Fairview High School, we have over 2,100 students, close to 2,180 now. So when you change the teaching ratio from 26 to 27, that actually removes three teachers from our building. But more importantly than just the three teachers, it also removes 15 course sections from our building. So you might say, well, okay, so we'll organize around that and figure out how to get rid of 15 sections. But you can't get rid of things like ninth grade language arts. Those are courses that are mandated by the state. Students must take them. So when you look at how to get rid of 15 sections out of your building, you look at classes that aren't necessarily mandatory but might have been very attractive for students to take. So for example, the upper level science and math courses that are not mandated by the state but have provided phenomenal opportunities for our students over the years. So for example, and also maybe as a secondary impact, no longer can you juggle classes so they all have reasonable class sizes because there's less movement in the schedule. So just to give you a couple of examples, Calculus BC this year at Fairview High School has 45 students. Physics 2, which is a laboratory-based course, has 38 students. And in that, we even turned students away because there was no more room for them to be in the room, yet we couldn't open another section for them to be present. And so because of the numbers of students, wow, I already am out of time. Am I allowed to continue for 30 more seconds? What? Yeah. Go ahead, okay. please. So I just want to give you a little bit of evidence for why this is so significant. This week was the announcement of the Intel Science Talent Search semifinalists. This is one of the most high recognitions that a high school student can get in the sciences. The list of California students is long. The list of New York students is long. Colorado has managed to bring nine students in the last 10 years who stayed on the list almost every year for the last 10 years. Out of those nine students, six of them came from Fairview. One of them was homeschooled. Two of them came from elsewhere in the state. This is a shining example of our school district and really the incredible rapport that we have in the sciences and other technical fields. So it's just a little bit sad to see this disappear. So as you consider the opportunities you have in budgeting over the next few years, it would be really nice to bring back class size to the agenda. And I know it's not one of the most intriguing things to talk about, and there are lots more interesting ways to think about spending money sometimes, but it has an enormous impact on our larger schools. So I appreciate the extra 30 seconds. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Thank you for raising the questions. Um, board members, do, um, it is now time for board communication. Comments from. <laughs> I, I will comment. Yes, please, Jenny. Please. So thank you for um, to our speaker um, for coming to speak. I mean that that's the kind of public input that that's very valuable to us as we make. I, I will comment that the budget decisions we're making would be much easier if we received the amount of funding from the state that we were supposed to receive, <laughs> but. <laughs> <laughs> but 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 I but we will certainly be taking those kinds of things into account as we proceed forward this um, spring. And a letter to your state legislatures would not be amiss. Um, 
And then um, I, I just like to comment um, about um, some great things that are going on in um, Broomfield Public Schools because as you know, one of the needs that I, that the principals in Broomfield have expressed to the elementary principals is um, is a counselor. They would love to have counselors, full-time counselors at, at the schools to help um, help manage some of the issues that are faced by their students. And so they've started, um, they, they've taken that in hand and decided to act on their own and they're not actually hiring counselors but um, but um, they are they have started raising money to do some other things that they can do with volunteers and I know a few people who are volunteering at Birch and I just started a friendship group today so um, anyway so I'd like to, to give a shout out to our principal our principals not just in Broomfield <laughs> but I know throughout the um, district that are hard at work um, trying to figure out ways to meet the needs of kids with limited resources Thank you. Board members, anyone else? Comments? Um, I too, Helen, would like to thank you for coming to speak. You know, I, I'll take a, a moment about a personal issue for me. Um, my kids graduated from Fairview High School, so I'm pretty in tune with, with what happened while, um, while they were there. And my children were able to take eight classes when they were students there. And today they're able to take seven. Um, and that's a real limitation, I think, of what we're talking about here is how a curriculum has been really changed and how the cap, we've set a cap in some ways about what kids can explore and the kinds of levels of courses they can take. I don't know what it means in terms of science or math or um, jazz programs, which is what my kids did, but I mean, they did many different things and I just think it's a really important thing to think about. So Bruce, well, I guess what I would ask for you is, is that if you would um, follow up with the questions and issues that have been raised here about what class size means, um, it, it could be different between elementary school and high schools and, and what, the class, what the effect is. And I know we've talked about that, the, the huge cost of what it would cost, $4 million approximately, I think, is the number is if we were to look at class size reduction. But I think it's a really important question as we're looking at our budget issues these days to think about how, how to allocate these funds. Um, it, it distresses me to have kids not have the same options that they've had in the past. So, and I know that firsthand. I mean, that was what my kids had when I was there, and they, it's no longer there. So, except in a few, as I understand it, a few extraordinary cases with kids who are taking advanced IB science classes, I think, maybe, and maybe some other kinds of exceptional classes. But I just think it's a really important thing for us to look at. Shelley. Yeah, I want to thank you as well, Helen, for, for coming forward. Um, I hear a lot about parents who are concerned about class size but very few of them you know, have the time or make the effort to come in front of the board and, and state their case. So I wanna thank you very much for doing that. We really appreciate it. And you should know that you know, all of us have that on our mind, how to address that issue and within budget limitations. So thank you very much. Ah, what's the next thing on the agenda? Okay, I think that wraps up um, board communication. So the next item on our agenda is um, consent groupings. And today that consists of 6.1 personnel items, 6.2 approval of minutes December 9th, 2014 special meeting, 6.3 approval of minutes December 9th, 2014 regular meeting, 6.4 approval of minutes December 16th, 2014 special meeting, 6.5 approval of minutes January 5th, 2015 special meeting, 6.6 .6, acceptance of donation El Dorado K8, 6.7 acceptance of donation human resources, 6.8 Acceptance of donation, instructional services and equity. 6.9, acceptance of donation from Mesa Elementary. 6.10, acceptance of donation from Whittier Elementary. 6.11, proposed Boulder Valley School District calendars for 2015-16 and 2016-2017. So that'll be nice to get some in on for two years. Uh, 6.12, resolution regarding notice of meetings for the Board of Education. And um, that's it. Do I have a motion to approve? Jenny, is there a second? Sam? Uh, are there any items that anyone would like to pull? Seeing none. Are there any items that anyone has questions on? Jenny? So there's a, there's a, um, a donation to human resources. What's that money going to be used for? Well, I guess we could donate. Uh, I, I 
Oh, oh. A very generous donation, obviously. <laughs> and that's an annual event. So, um, Oh, well, then thank you to the Boulder Valley Credit Union because that is very, a very generous. Nice thanks. Event. I didn't yes. catch that. But that's what that is. Yeah. Long standing supporters. And we'll see you all at the retirement the celebration in May. Uh, are there other questions? Yeah. What? Yeah. Yes. Well, please. just a comment. Just, you so, know, every year we see this uh, generous donation in the hundreds of thousands of dollars from the Boulder Bookstore. So worth thanking them and noting that we enjoy the support of local businesses including the bookstore it's very uh it's a, i mean I, I, there's so many districts where that's not true and so it bears noting that we have strong support from the business community and i'm grateful to the bookstore for kicking in at this generous level every year thank you Excellent. they've been terrific supporters for years and we're grateful for their support jim just a quick comment on the, the district calendar. So I've noticed uh, a lot of other districts have been finalizing their calendars going forward. They all seem to look a lot like ours. Um, <laughs> but I also note that um, for my seven years on the board, the calendar is always pretty uh, a pretty hot topic. And I think the work that the committee did several years ago, I think they really nailed it by evidence of how, how well this has worked for the district in the last two years. So I think a, a thank you to the committee from two years ago um, and a commitment to keep rolling it forward because it seems to be working. So thank you. Thanks, Jim. Uh, other comments? Okay, I have a comment. I have a comment and a question on, uh, I can't get it all together in one place, but it's on the resolution for where we post our agenda information. And I think the way it's written is that the agenda, I'm going to read it here. It's um, the therefore sentence in that resolution, the last sentence. It says, um, the agenda I'm shall be posted 24 hours in advance outside the boardroom at the district's education center. Well, that's a locked room. People can't get in there. So I'm just wondering if there might be another place. I mean, that door has been open for years prior to our um, more higher level of security. And I think that this is designed for the public to be able to have access to it. So is there a way we could um, publish this online somehow in, in a different, I mean, I know the agenda's online because it's online starting in, uh, on Thursday evening. I mean, it's like clockwork, it's always out here. But something out here doesn't, um, it's helpful just prior to the meeting, but the door's only open for an hour before the meeting. So I'm just, can you think about that? I mean, we could look at our entryway or something that has public access. I mean, the entryway would be the most logical place, probably. The okay. entryway of the building would be the, probably the yeah. most logical place because it's open during business hours. Yeah. We could certainly look at that, Laurie. Thanks. Yeah. Jim. Per perhaps they could just put it on the outside doors they of the room. Door. I don't know how many people in my experience have, have come there to see what the agenda is, but I, I hear your point sure. of having opportunity. Well. So. Yeah, well, or maybe the inside. I mean, I like the idea of right inside the door. I mean, it's. I think it's public and says that we're meeting. Yeah, do that. Maybe people will come. <laughs> okay. <laughs> to start. <laughs> kind of funny. Well, anyway, so how can we handle this? Um, can you just um, modify it and just say they'll be placed at the entryway of the district? I, I have no objection with the rest of the document. But yeah, or we can just do it, too. Okay, so would, we can just go ahead and approve it with that change that's in it. Both. Great. Okay. Um, are there any other um, items to be discussed mm -hmm. on this agenda? I have to look one more time. No, okay. Um, if there are no other items, um, Sandy, will you please call the roll? Albright? Yes. Bell Bell? Yes. Benford? Yes. Fuqua? Yes. Marquis? Yes. Myers? Yes. Reed? Yes. Motion passes. Gads, what's next? Okay, um, the next item on our agenda is um, revision to board policy IF, the curriculum development and revision um, policy, which, and thank you for bringing it forward. We've talked to you, I mean, we've expressed interest in bringing forward um, policies that need to be revisited. So thank you, Bruce, and yep. I'll give a brief set to here? this. And so Dr. Ron Cabrera, our Assistant Superintendent for Sectional Services and Equity, will present this to you this evening. 
Um, this is a policy that gives us guidance and accompanying regulations on the process we work through uh, when we bring items forward ultimately to the board. And so with input from those in the field and also our leadership at this level, um, these are proposed revisions. This has gone through um, the typical review process we do both at the cabinet level, our teachers association, a legal review. So we think it's uh, ready for your, your review and uh, questions that you might have in comment. And so it's listed uh, this evening, as you'll note, as a, a study item, and we'd hope to bring it back in two weeks as an action item. So Dr. Cabrera, if you would, please. Thank you very much, Dr. Messenger, Madam President, members of the board. Um, so in front of you, you've seen, uh, you have a red line copy of the, of the current policy, uh, policy IF that was established in 1980, what are right there, 1985. Things have changed since that time. And so uh, this is actually came forward in the process of a conversation that we had probably for six or seven months beginning in September of, 19, or, of 2013, excuse me, uh, when I arrived. And so uh, what we've tried to do, in short, is to streamline the process so to make sure that things that have kind of that grew out of it kind of came back together so we could have a consistent process to uh, review proposed curriculum or revised curriculum in an established manner that would kind of uphold the integrity of what we wanted to have in our curriculum. So we made it as an annual event one time a year to ensure that there's proper time that it could be reviewed by all the necessary parties, content, curriculum, councils, departments, and the like. Because <coughs> previously there had been two times a year that it occurred, and ensure that the time would be that when it came to you, you have you could um, if you approved it, then it could move forward to the typical registration process that begins around this time, put into our course catalogs and be ready for students to review and see if that's something that they would like. In addition, what this policy does now says that there's a body called the the uh, Coordinating Curriculum Council that provides recommendation and actually along with the superintendent's office before it comes to you. Before we had, or previously we had actually two bodies that were kind of involved in this, the uh, Coordinating Curriculum Council and there was something called the Curriculum Advisory Board. And so we were kind of working in parallel fashion. And so we thought that's not very helpful because you know the right hand doesn't always know what the left hand is doing so we want to bring it down to one body. So we did that and one other thing you probably noticed that we removed some language that talked about trial basis of courses. Uh, and part of the thinking here was not that we are wanting to uh, contain good ideas, but rather the conversation we had was that we felt that courses that would be put in front of students ought to be well thought, well conceived, meeting the requirements they have of any course. So in fact, they ought to go through the curriculum new course proposal process and, and if it were you know approved, then it, it would go forward and even if it was a brand new course. So that was the thinking in terms of kind of streamline and tighten up that language. Um, and as I mentioned about the timing process to have it done once a year. So uh, some questions came up. So, you know, what if, Ron, in the past, you know, a new course bubbled up in, 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 in January and we would go through a spring process to get it um, approved. And that's true, we said that's in the past because what happens, it circumvented the process of having everyone take a look at the course. It circumvented the process of it being in the course catalog for kids to really have a chance to take a look at it. So we asked for a kind of a disciplined approach in new courses or a review of courses, and that's what we hope the policy uh, provides for, and then obviously reinforced by uh, the regulations. Questions or comments? Thank you, Dr. Cabrera. Board members, Sam. Could you explain that, that to me a little bit more? What was the problem with uh, a course coming up in January and being reviewed in the spring? Maybe well, I misunderstood you. Okay, so it wouldn't have gone through the full review process okay. in previously uh, by the different groups. We had a limited number of meetings. So what we've done, Sam, now is to make sure that our meeting times with the content councils and the curriculum coordinating council are really positioned to be in the fall when new course proposals come forward. So everyone has a good chance to review it chance for dialogue and if there's changes that need to be made then they can be done in a timely fashion. <coughs> so I mean, so let me just say we, again, this is to tighten up the process. Yeah. It gotten a little bit loose and so we felt like there was a place at times that we needed to put some structure to it. Courses coming up in second semester weren't getting as thorough a, That's a vetting. And I, I, I see you struck language about uh, these uh, proposals being available for public review and comment prior to uh, 
getting to us? Why, why did you strike that? Well, because that seems to be something that was left over from, I think, probably uh, paralleling the uh, uh, textbook or instructional materials adoption process. To be honest with you, even during my tenure as principal, that didn't happen. It didn't go in front of public in terms for public review. Now, I would say the exceptions to this, obviously, would be if there are some highly sensitized sort of courses that would come forward. Obviously, we want to make sure it gets vetted in front of public as well as teachers to make sure that we have a good course that's coming forward. Let's take an example, our health curriculum. Now, that obviously we would pause and kind of reshape the process a little bit, but typically speaking, new courses um, aren't uh, put out in public uh, like we would do with the materials adoptions. What we rely on instead is that the beginning process, that it bubbles up from typically school sites, a department has a chance to review it, understands the needs of their students. Administration gets a chance to review it and say, yeah, it has merit in terms of what we think for our curriculum. Then it moves down the pipeline to our content councils. That, so different folks throughout the district gets a chance to take a look at review at the, uh, the curriculum and say, yeah, it meets the standards. It meets what we think is representative of what we want to have in our district. And finally, it lands the curriculum coordinating council and it's a K-12 perspective to say, all right, how does it align K through 12? You know, how does it meet our needs? Um, you know, what's, what's the change? And, and there's a number of guiding questions that you see in the policy that kind of speaks to that. And then if it's through our process, we actually use a rubric to help score some of this and with dialogue. If it moves forward, um, superintendent office also gets to put um, eyes on it and then it ultimately ends up in front of you. So it's somewhat involved in that kind of, well, so, that doesn't quite answer all of why it's not in front of public. It's a timing thing at this point. Uh, I would say to some case, um, it's, but it hasn't been practiced for a long time. So we thought things that don't seem to be practiced over time seems to me suggest that either it was an appendage that not necessary or it, it, what was valuable at that time is less valuable now. Well, I see that it's a pretty thorough process. Yeah. I always get a little nervous when we reduce public review, I guess, yeah. or the opportunities for, even sure. if it wasn't happening anyway. So you're saying, though, if you, we trust the judgment of the staff that if a course proposal comes forward that we think may be controversial, we might add an extra level Absolutely. of public comment? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, That's correct. Yeah. Um, are you yeah. Is there a follow-up question to that? Tina, please. Yeah. I, I think just because this is a long-lasting policy and will be guiding the actions of future boards and future district, well, mm -hmm. I, I absolutely trust this administrative staff and this board to um, take the highly sensitized things and make them available for review. I think I might feel more comfortable if that is the practice or that, that it's in the policy so that the public always feels that there's an opportunity to review um, curricular materials. Uh, and, and it's just, and it's for those highly sensitized things, just because we do have other boards in the state that have taken actions that weren't in favor with the public, and the public, I felt, didn't have the opportunities to have input or participate in that decision. So if there is a sentence, something like this, I just, <coughs> curriculum that's perceived to be highly sensitized, highly sensitive and or controversial um, would allow for public review or something like that? Or it could be something that just says at any time the public can ask to review or something like that. I, because what is highly sensitized or curriculum would be based on sort of the beholder. Um, so w you may not think, you know, I may not see, think something is controversial, but someone else might. And I think that's what kind of happens is people have such different viewpoints. Not, not at this time and place in Boulder, but um, it, I th I, it could happen at some point. Okay. Shall I? Thanks, Tina. <clears throat> Yeah, I would, I would like to add to um, Tina's comments that I, I think a statement like this needs to stay in there because we're not just talking about like a health curriculum which on its face could be controversial. I mean, there are concerns about math curriculum and there are concerns about books that are read in ninth grade English. And so I don't think that we can necessarily say what is sensitive to someone mm -hmm. else. So okay. I think there ought to be a general statement that any curriculum is available for review by the public. Jenny? Well, no, I, I'm confused, so I have to ask a question. We're not talking about removing the public's opportunity to review curriculum and course materials, are we? Um, no. 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 So, so this so is just a process for adoption of new curriculum for no, review and new, revision that come to you. 
And so it looks as if previously there had been a potentially a step yeah. that. So this is only about new courses, but not, but the new curriculum will, con I mean, if we're buying new materials. Oh, absolutely. And adopting new curriculum, yes. that's, we still have a policy that says that that has to be reviewed by the public and we're not but anticipating that that would ever change. That is correct, Jenny. Oh, okay. But can I ask a question? But if we have a new curriculum, we have curriculum materials associated with that. Right, right, and so that's a different policy. Okay. <coughs> that's not this policy. Okay. This is about a course, not about materials. Right. Okay. And, and I'm saying I think even as a course, it ought to be available for review, mm -hmm. just as a matter of transparency. Okay. Tom? Yeah, yeah, I agree. I, I, I like the statement the way it is, and I think it should remain the way it is, that proposed new or revised cur uh, curriculum shall be available for public view. didn't say we're going to go out and, you know, make any effort to, uh, you know, form any meetings or anything to review it, but it's available. Anybody who's there wants to come see it. I like it. I don't know why we'd want to strike it. Do you have a comment on this? No? Sam? But I guess it is for a brief window of time when our agenda is published, right? Then that, yeah, that may not be long enough, but mm -hmm. that is an opportunity for review. So. Okay. Shelley? <clears throat> um, Ron, I also have a question about, I think it's page two. Mm -hmm. Is it two? Yeah, page two. You know where all the yellow highlighting is? that little phrase before the number five, is there some reason we don't want to talk about learner outcomes for curricula? Let me grab that real quickly. I thought I had it right in front of me. But. Oh, sorry. At the end of four could be prior to five. <clears throat> And it seems like we're talking about a lot of other things in that section, and sure, it's the I'm questions. just wondering why that that in that thing in particular was deleted. I would think that would actually be one of the most important things to care about. All right. Um, okay, so I'm fumbling with my papers here, and I yeah, apologize for that. I don't have that right in front of me right now. I don't have that particular. So uh, give that to me again. I can just yeah. See. You know that this the section under new course proposals at the top of page two. Yes. If you drop down to item number five there in the first paragraph. Which, yes. Oh, there are two okay, fives. Just, just before that five that there's a clause that's been struck out. How the new course aligns with the district content standards. Yeah, and then it says the learner outcomes for the course and that was stricken through. You see that? Just yes, in, yes. I'm I just see. wondering why that was well, uh, I tell you what the conversation was. Okay. Not that that isn't important. Yeah. Because the requirement when they fill out the course proposal has them address that. And so in terms of just guiding questions, I guess, so here's, um, I'll say the presumption is, is that they're addressing our curriculum and our, and our academic standards and so they have to adhere to that even to get to the first place. So we were more interested, the conversation was, what will it do to increase value to our existing curricula? That was the, that was the intent of it. Well, I think if it's covered somewhere, that's fine. It just seems yeah. like it was taken out, so, yeah. So, I guess uh, I'm hearing you, you'd still like maybe to have some additional language to ensure that? Well, no, I just, oh. as long as it's in there yeah, somewhere, it's a, yeah. whether it's implied Thank you. by our standards or, mm. I, it, yeah, I think it's fine. Thanks. Tina. Um, so does this policy in general uh, relate to social and emotional curricula that are adopted by the schools? And do, and I should add at the same time, do our instructional materials adoption policy also relate to social and emotional? And, and I, again, I, and I, I know I've said this a couple times, but schools are adopting these curricula, they're buying materials, and they're devoting time in the classroom, and yet we haven't reviewed any of these or seen any of these programs come to the board, and nor have they been available for public review. So I just, um, I'm just understanding how that fits in this, or if it's considered a separate component. I'd say heretofore has been considered as a separate component, and it has been, say, as an example, a, a school-based mm -hmm. initiative that has gone forward for 
a response to, let's say, something, uh, a grant, a community, this type of thing. And so they're trying to address a school-based problem that they thought would be helpful. Now, it's a different question to just ask, you know, ought it? And I, I don't know that I'm prepared to answer that just right now, Tina, but right now, I said the typical practice that in those circumstances, that it has been, those have been school-based decisions around kind of unique programs. Does it make a difference if the school raises the funds privately through their PTO or gets a grant versus whether they use funds that are provided by the district? So for instance, I think some schools have used district funds to buy social emotional curricula, whereas other districts have used fundraising. Is there more freedom for the schools mm. if they use their own funds or their privately run or parent raised funds? So I guess I'd say if they were using district funds, they were using it under the auspices of our health curriculum as an example for most of our social emotional things. and so. Um, I would say the practice would be that that had been cleared by my division to go to that route. Now, if they're doing things that are independent of that, using independent funding, then we typically have less control of that. Thank you. Here. Shelley? Um, this has come up a couple of times, mm -hmm. and it also came up as part of the privacy discussion. Remember, we were talking about those behavioral apps that teachers are using. Sure. And I think it's time that we discuss this and have a conversation about what's going on out there and what kind of policy we want to have around that. Around? Around teachers and, you know, grant grantors um, <coughs> making available programs that we don't know anything about and that vary from school to school and from teacher to teacher. And I think I mentioned, for example, that this <coughs> dojo app or whatever it was and how it caused concern throughout DAP when people realized that teachers were using stuff like that and they didn't realize it. Okay. So I think we need a policy on what we allow to happen in our classroom. Whether it's privately funded or you know mm -hmm. funded by the school or if it's a grant or whatever it is we should have control over what's happening in the classroom. And so are, we, are you thinking that that would be a part of this policy? No, or be a I think it's an independent, I agree with uh, We need something like this it's, it's, for that. It's kind of triggering okay. that thinking. Yeah. Okay. So this policy is really about courses that are sponsored by the district and sanctioned by the district can be applied to any classroom in the district, you know, as appropriately funded and so forth. Okay. Okay. But we still can put it on agenda setting to. Right. Yeah. Or however, yeah. Great, thanks. So, Bruce, you might want to send out a note and ask what our concerns are for um, about this um, idea about socio-emotional and a curricula that uh, people are um, purchasing perhaps independently. Let's have a conversation about it. We're sort of out of order. I'm kind of in agenda setting here, but but I think that's you know it might be good to see what comments questions people have about that. Yep. Okay. Thank you. I, mean, I think they're good questions. Do you have other questions or comments to this? Um, well, I had a question. Mm -hmm. um, first of all, we got a couple numbers. We got two number fives in there. I mean, I think it needs a sharp edit. There's some words that, I mean, some of these sentences aren't sentences or questions, yeah, aren't correct. questions. Mm -hmm. um, and, but the one I really was puzzled by was number seven, uh, as it's written, which is not a question. I mean, all statement. of these numbers yeah. say, respond to the several guiding questions, and then number seven says, the prior review by other appropriate groups as determined by the assistant superintendent. And so I just think it should be phrased in the form of a question um, to be in a parallel format. So that's that's one comment. Yeah. Well, but the I other question, pardon me? I was just gonna say, I actually, I think the, the driving clause is the process for securing the approval of new courses requires the submission of the proposal that includes and then you're right, it does lead itself into responding to different questions, so we probably need, there is an and statement there that's supposed to disconnect it, but we can we can edit that piece. Well, yeah. I think it, it just needs a sharp edit. I mean, okay. I think the points are good points, but yeah. it just, you know, clean it clean it up a little bit. Okay. I, w my question on that number seven was mm -hmm. the prior review by other appropriate groups. Like, what were you thinking? What would be an example for that? So, in terms of process, as I was sharing with you, it needs, a course that comes forward before it comes to you needs to be reviewed by first um, within the school, a department, uh, someone will surface it, the department has of, of college would say yes, it has merit, 
be reviewed by the leadership team within the school before it starts moving through the process to the content curriculum, uh, the cr content curriculum councils, and then curriculum coordinating council and the like. That's what they infers. Okay. Yeah. All right. Sure. Good. Um, I, I had another question, um, and I can't remember exactly how we've done this. I think I've done it two different ways. One is to when a new um, policy or a policy is being reviewed, mm -hmm. um, to bring the policy but not the regulations. But do you have the regulations? Um, w will you be working on them, both yes. the forms and the regulations? Yes. So when, is it possible, and this may not be convenient time-wise, but mm -hmm. would it be possible to bring that information together with the policy? Yeah, I was just thinking it's good. It's good to see the regulations together with yeah, this because it yep. puts it in a that. context, makes it a little bit more clear. So, okay. all right. So, want to bring this back? Yep. Two weeks. Two weeks. I'll be back. Twenty seventh. For okay. action. Good. All right. Okay. Thank you. Give Appreciate your input. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. It's good. It's good that we're looking at these new things. <laughs> Thank you. Policies are what? Well, I know, but it well was well aged. It was, well aged. It was yeah, but it was re it was re Better things. Jim and I reworked on it. it was uh, 2005. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. I think That's maybe I don't know. Maybe we didn't. Okay. Um, the next item of our um, on our agenda is um, agenda setting. Shelley, I think you and Tina were focusing on this question about a policy for curriculum that people might be purchasing independently. So that would be one thing to talk about. And social-emotional curricula, mm -hmm. whether or not it's purchased independently. Okay, so what the district's social-emotional curricula? What the school's is and just how it fits with the district and public and board review. Okay, okay, all right, good. Anyone else? Okay, um, I had one more thing. Um, I think that's it for agenda setting. I guess um, just a, a review, Bruce, you, you said this early in your comments, but you just remind us one more time. We're meeting with this uh, to discuss the strategic plan next week. Is that right? Uh, Two weeks no, from now. We canceled, so we canceled the work session next week because of our uh, other work on the 21st. So we uh, used, received cancellation of the work session that would normally would be the third Tuesday. So that's off your calendars. And then uh, on the 27th, two weeks from tonight, we'll have a work session right. prior to our regular board meeting from 5 to 6, as we did this evening. And the topic right now we're planning is strategic planning over a light meal, and then we'll have our regular meeting starting at 6. So that's two weeks from tonight, the 27th. Okay. Good. Um, any chance we'll have budget information on that? Or, I mean, is that something that you're thinking to have Not at that time. We, no? we won't. Okay. No. So it's ongoing discussion, right. seeing where we, where we are all are. We're doing. Okay, good. Sounds good. All right. If there are no other items to discuss tonight, we're adjourned. Thank you for coming today.